Yep, and we do have that third uh, barracks getting an add-on built. No factory quite yet, but he is taking his second gas geyser now, also taking the third gas at his expansion, which is something I, re I really like seeing players do. You know, you don't necessarily want to go up to four geysers extremely quick. Uh, it's great to just get three. You get a nice balance of gas and uh, minerals there. Also getting an engineering bay. Might opt to get a turret up pretty soon to uh, fend off any observers. He should be taking notice of that little squiggle there. You kind of want to deny that observer as soon as possible. Yeah, the observer's going to get in here. Just see that there are only three racks up with the engineering bay for some upgrades and possibly some turrets, as you mentioned before. Uh, back here on Sayer's side of things, though, Nerzul's going to move up with his SV. He does spot the next expansion as well. Knows his opponent is on two bases as well. Here come the Immortals, just going to knock out those destructible rocks, secure that nice, easy-to-secure bottom right-hand corner expansion for a little while as he puts up another two gateways. So four gate robo coming out in total for Sear. Very uh, immortal heavy composition, but here is a big force moving out for Nerzul. Now a lot of marauders, eight marauders in that group, along with about oh 14 marines. And here he comes up. Now these immortals, it's how quickly these are going to go down. Oh, the sentries are being brought to the front, though. One gets picked off. It had full energy. Where are the force fields? Now finally they are, but both of the immortals go down for free. And all of the rest of the units dying. Sarah is just losing everything for getting those force fields for so long. Those immortals just uh, were obliterated. Finally, force fielding has ramped, but Nerzu is going to be able to walk through this expansion, and all of these probes are going to die. Yeah, that is a ton of trouble there for Sarah. Looks, it looked like his observer was just a bit out of position, and he didn't see his opponent's army moving out, and he got entirely caught off guard. And losing that Nexus just sets him behind so, so far on top of, of course, losing the Immortals. And he's down about uh, 20 supply on his opponent, and these probes are trying to run for their lives. <laughs> And the probes are going to make it away pretty far. They are speedier than the unstim units that are coming out. But uh, where exactly are they going to run to? They're certainly not going to be doing any mining, I'll tell you that. And uh, so Sayer is moving out to his expansion one more time. He doesn't have the amount of resources to put that down. Um, these bio units not going to catch those probes in flight, unfortunately. But uh, a healthy lead for Nerzuli. He's up by 22 supply. He has two bases. He's actually producing a third, so he's going to go to a really quick third base. He already has a reactor ready for that starport, so this is going to be very, very strong MMM play. And when those first couple of medivacs come up and heal up all those units, Nerzul is going to look even better. Yeah, things are things are just looking so, so good here. The Observer from Sarah seeing he's taking out these destructive rocks, and I mean... It's just so hard for Protoss to do anything when the Terran player just decides, you know what, I killed a Nexus, I'm just going to play completely passively, and it's going to be so difficult for him to do anything, especially once that goal kicks in. Two more barracks being added. Looks like no upgrades quite yet, which is a bit concerning. Definitely want to be getting some of those, but uh, it just almost doesn't matter because he's just so, so far ahead right now. Yeah, that he is, but, um, you know, it's those little things you don't want to miss and, you know, kind of in the heat of battle and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like we do have a couple of medevacs heading down. Nerzul is not going ahead and healing himself up for the time being. Those rocks he sees did go down. Now the first couple of medevacs heading out. That's going to use all their energy, but it will bring this back up to full health. Or I'm a dirty liar. Nerzul is just going to <laughs> move in, greeting those medevacs for the time being. Uh, one force shield goes down there. Still those force shields not doing all that much. All those zealots, yeah, they're absorbing damage. Damage, but uh, finally a couple better force fields go down. That's going to allow the Immortals to pick off a couple of units. Um, but now Nerzul is going to push in, stimming up one more time, using that the advantage of that concussive shell to pick off both the Immortals very quickly. Well, actually, one Immortal. There goes down the second one, finally. And there's the GG! And apparently I just remained in the game for what reason, I don't know. But uh, Nerzul does take this game. Uh, and we're going to see go into game number two here very, very soon. Yeah, very solid match there. Very nice play from Nerzul, just, you know, basically being in the driver's seat the entire time, doing a great job keeping track of his opponent, seeing exactly when that Nexus went down, keeping an eye on the unit composition, and just pressuring when he had the opportunity, and that huge mistake there from Sayer, uh, not force fielding immediately, not seeing his opponent's army move out, just set him back so far, and Nerzul just played safe and didn't give his opponent a chance to get back into the game. All right, so that was UMBC versus Pitt, game number one. We're going to be moving into game number two, as I mentioned before. So 
Oh, excuse me, guys. Sorry. Uh, like I said, not feeling tip-top right now, so do apologize for that. Oh, my lovely wife bringing me some water, though. What a lifesaver. I do appreciate that very much. So, UMBC versus Pitts. Just waiting on the infight for the next match. There we go. And we'll be back, guys, here in just a second. Okay, so we're going to get game number two here. Ooh, member of P formerly Pokemon, now Saga Clan, I believe. And Zog, two ridiculously good players. This is going to be fun. Yeah, especially on uh, GSL Karas. This is a, a lot of options for both players playing on this map. Should be fun to see what kind of builds they like to go for. Uh, PVZ, you know, sometimes matched up, not too fun to watch, but on this map, it is awesome to watch. And here we go, game getting underway. Okay, so everyone loading up. Hey, I'm not the slowest one to load this time. That's a plus. <laughs> and begin here in three, two, one, mark. So thanks, guys, again for joining me. This is the Cat's Pajamas alongside Anna BC. We are broadcasting the CSL Round of 32 action out of the playoffs. Day number four of that Round of 32, a matchup between uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and University of Pittsburgh. We have the representative of UMBC down here in the bottom right-hand corner of GSL Crevasse. He is, let's see here, Sujun Moon. Sujun Moon, I love that name. His uh, He goes by Lunatone Pokemon. Hope that's not Lunatone. I'm sorry, my uh, Pokemon not really up to par at the moment. Um, but I believe I used to have a lot of contact with the Pokemon clan. They are an all-Korean-American clan. And I believe they switched over to Clan Saga, so I believe this is a member of Clan Saga. He's a 3,400 Masters Protoss player, 57% win rate on the ladder, 9-0 in his 1v1s here in the CSL. Four of those against Zergs won the one ace match he played to give his school the victory over UC Riverside in the regular season. His opponent here at the top left-hand corner is Baruch Talbot, also known as Zog. Is a 4,100 Masters rated Zerg player with a 53% win rate on ladder. 8-0 in his 1v1s. 2-0 against Zerg. He is Pitt's strongest and also highest ranked on the ladder player. He is also their ace player. So PVC, like you were mentioning before, on Krafos can be really interesting. And it starts being really interesting right at the beginning when players decide to take, um, you know, decide which base they are going to take. As Zog actually dropping down to 16 hatch outside of his main at that full mineral, full gas expansion. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a Nexus first build as well. So this is actually, I would have to say, the most standard way to open on this map. Zerg, the Zerg player taking that uh, more wide open expansion to make sure they have all four geysers, whereas the Protoss player just expanding inside of their own base. And we'll see, it looks like, yep, a forge going down now. And uh, the Protoss player has indeed scouted his opponent, but not actually seeing uh, that he did take that more exposed natural. Going to go ahead and check that out right now, though. Yeah, and we'll see how aggressive uh, he decides to be. He's going to get a cannon up out at his base. It's going to make a nice little wall, we'll guard himself against a lot of early harassment. Ooh, he's moving to the back here, and uh-oh, there's a pylon. So if Ooh. he has the opportunity, we... Oh, there's two pylons. Ooh, well, nope maybe doesn't want to wall himself in thought he was going to wall himself in so he could drop down a couple of easy photon cannons well defended at the back and there there is drone number one we'll see if this pylon gets cancelled no that's uh, probe running away there's photon cannon number one photon cannon number two and this is a long walk distance for Zog to get down and bring out some units so it's going to take him a while he did let that hatchery finish and these photon cannons are going to come up and do a lot of damage yeah, I think he's in a lot of trouble here. I'm not a Protoss or Zerg player, so I'm not sure how much trouble the Zerg player is indeed in, but there's no spines coming up. There's not really any lings coming in production either, so I think he's just going to go ahead and sacrifice this hatchery because what else can he really do? He is re-expanding to his own in-base natural, 
He's, he's not really making any links look like. Looks like he is starting Zergling speed, though. And yeah, the hatchery is going to, get, to be going down, and that's just going to put uh, Lunatone quite, quite far ahead. Although, of course, he did have to spend a fair amount of resources uh, on this, but it's definitely going to be paying off. Yes, he did, but I mean, he killed the 300 resources of the hatchery in all that time to get up the expansion. He forces Zog into the smaller mineral base, and he uh, Zog was actually producing some drones there at his natural and one of those was actually picked off immediately, so um, that was actually picked off as well. So Zog is actually in a pretty bad position, really has to come back from this. He is putting up a Roach Warren for the time being, but uh, Lunatone has already gone. Looks like he's finishing up his gateway for the time being. He'll go into a cybernetic score here in just a second and a couple of gas geysers. But, um, yeah, right now, I mean, he's done his damage. He took out, ooh, looks like a little bit of a lag there from Zog. I'm just glad it's not me, frankly. <laughs> and uh, these photon cannons are still going to cause, you know, a lot of units to come up and a lot of units to be pulled off just to take care of these. So they're still going to have some effect here, even in the uh, even in the short term. Yeah, and I mean, it, like, the question is, like, he did get that roach worn up. He's not making any roaches quite yet. Like, if he goes for a roach bust, the rush distance on this map is just so long that uh, I can't imagine Lunatone not really being ready for that. Uh, there are lings moving across the map. Maybe he just wants to go ahead and try and scout the front to gauge whether or not he can bust. There's now three roaches in production, but uh, that's really about it. And, and I, I'm just feeling like this counterattack isn't really going to work. But, of course, there's only one cannon out, and that's obviously not going to be enough. So it's going to come down to, is Lunatone going to be able to see uh, what, what's coming up here? Yeah, and with the sentry, he's going to be able to make a pretty good defense as well, especially if he can split, you know, say two of those roaches on the low ground, so only one and a couple of zerglings come up. And this photon cannon should be able to range and pick off most of those units for a while. Uh, but Zog maybe just wants to assault this photon cannon pylon defense that's actually at his base, as Lunatone is putting down another pylon here towards the 12 o'clock position just north of the North Cell Naga Tower, out of the range of that Overlord. He's going to be able to warp some units onto the low ground. I believe that a few can just fit in that little gap. And finally, here come the units. They're going after the Photon Cannons. Oh, and he loses a Roach! Ooh. He loses another Roach at Photon Cannon now with eight kills. So all, I mean, still, still Lunatone is doing a lot of damage with those Photon Cannons and Pylons. Yeah, and it looks like Lunatone might just be going for a six-gate timing here. He's going to have actually plus one complete, so Zerglings are just going to get absolutely eaten alive. There are more cannons going up just to be safe. Warp Gate is now finishing, and uh, this attack could be quite devastating. You see there's actually two probes on the map, one controlling that Zellnogger Tower, one with a proxy pylon already set up, so things are going to be so, so scary. There is an Overlord that could try and sneak in, um, but I just don't think he's going to be able to really scout this at all, and this is... Very, very scary for Zog. Yeah, very scary. I mean, he's doing the right thing as far as trying to catch himself back with a little bit of a desperate measure, putting up that third base and hoping he could defend for long enough to allow that extra production and extra larvae to come in. But I don't know if he has that luxury. It looks like he's going to range these destructible debris for a while. I really think that Lunatone is okay with this. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not an optimal situation. Really don't like the fact that he only has one pylon guarding these three very critical structures and a couple of photon cannons. But, oh, look at this. Lunatone saying, I'll give you a hand with those <laughs> destructible debris, knocking those down, throwing down the Guardian Shield, and pushing out to his natural. And uh, I actually really love this positioning on this second proxy pond to it is behind the destructible rocks here, so it's going to be pretty safe from any Zerglings. But, of course, an Overlord does see that, so Zog should know what's coming. He is actually getting Burrow, and Burrow is a great response. Uh, the only thing is, I believe, the hatchery here at the... Uh, natural might die and that's actually going to set him back so far and it just might end up being too many gateway units we'll have to see if he can get up enough roaches in time and buy himself enough time to have uh, Burrow finished without just getting completely overwhelmed. And poor Zog has finished this base twice now. It stayed up about <laughs> just as long each time. There goes down the hatchery. Those broodlings are going to be not so effective off of Creep. And Lunatone will still turn around and pick those off. Now going through these destructible debris at the front of the base. Burrow is still not done for another 15 seconds. And Zog trying to delay as best as he can. But there's the Guardian Shield going to deflect a lot of that damage. And Zog is going to lose a lot of units before Burrow finishes. 
And so here come the rest of the units. Now Lunatone is going to push in. There's the burrow. This queen gets killed. Overlords can't burrow, so they're going to fall down. And that's going to supply block Zog very badly. Lunatone looking so strong, putting up five pylons now at his base. Baruthings coming out to do something.